Linux Luddites, episode 89, for the 17th of October, 2016. Hello and welcome to Linux Luddites, the show where we try all the latest free and open source software and then decide that we like the old stuff better. I'm Joe. I'm Jesse. And I'm Paddy. And after the news, today Joe and Jesse were taking a look at how the KDA desktop is shaping up, a mere 20 years down the line. And later we were spinning up Phoenix OS, another contender vying for attention in the increasingly crowded Android on the desktop space. But before we get into all of that, let's briefly talk about a couple of things we won't be talking about later. You mean Ubuntu 16.10? That's one of them, yep. Why is that not in the news, Paddy? That's surely a a massive release. I hope that was a rhetorical question. (laughs) It it clearly isn't. I mean, there was a time when we probably would have spoken about these sort of interim releases, but why? I mean, what do they actually add to the ecosystem? Well, in this case, Unity 8, I think, is, is worth a brief mention at least. It is working reasonably well there aren't many applications that will work within it but in terms of logging into the desktop and having it work as a functional desktop that's a pretty big step as far as i'm concerned mir is working well and so now they've got that solid foundation and there are a couple of releases to build on that and potentially have unity 8 be default for 1804 so as someone who's not followed the Ubuntu release particularly closely this time, are you saying that Unity 8 is is the default now or it's an option on that you can install? It's Well, you don't even have to install it. I installed it today, the, the Ubuntu 16.10, and at the login screen, it's just in the session chooser, you've got either standard Unity 7 or you can log into Unity 8. Uh, okay, but when you say thing uh, applications don't install, do you mean that... Uh, they haven't written applications specifically for Unity 8? Like, why can't you just install things as you did on Unity 7? Well, because of Mir. You try and run Firefox, for example, and it just gives you errors. That That's trying to run it in the terminal, and it's just not there. They're, they're only, there's only the, the crippled browser that um, everything thinks is Safari, specifically Google at least, thinks it's an outdated version of Safari. Um, and so you, you don't have any of the other applications, basically. So you try and run them and you just get errors because you need XMIR to run these X applications in Mir. So it's it's a case of they've got the foundation there and now they need to do all the rest of the work to get these apps that are built to run under X to run on Mir. But I mean, let's let's be honest, 1604 came out and that's the LTS. That was the big benchmark. And of course, there was probably a massive push internally at Canonical to get things stable and released and, and make a pucker version. And then now have you know, more time to think about what they want to do and and tweak and, and make work, Unity 8, for example, ready for maybe not this one, but perhaps for testing in the next release and the one after that before the next LTS comes out. So I'm not surprised that this is a bit of a, a yawn because we're one after an LTS. Well, yeah, I mean, this is the time when you chuck in all of the stuff that's going to break it because you've got to be pretty brave to run these interim releases. For, for example, with Ubuntu Mate, that's totally been rewritten to work with GTK3 now. And now is the time to do that when you've got a couple of releases before the next LTS. And if you actually want to use it day to day, you should probably stick on 1604 for the next couple of years. But if you want to test it, then that's what these interim releases are for. Yeah, I'll take that up to a point, but only up to a point, because it isn't just things like Unity that will be changing between these releases. There'll be a whole bunch of other packages that are updated as well. So you can't really view these as betas for the long-term support releases, because many things are changing between each release. So I, I don't know, I'm perhaps just getting older and grumpier and seeing this as make work, all these sort of very rapid release schedules. So what's the other thing that we uh, haven't mentioned in the news then? Oh, just another one of these make-work distros. That's uh, Fedora. And there's been a lot of hoo-ha about the fact the update has broken in um, a graphical environment, so you can't actually do updates. And they released an update for this, but because you can't install updates in the graphical environment, you can't fix it. So the only solution is DNF update, which is not a very difficult command to run, to be fair. 
It's not. Um, but here we are in 2016, and I'm just sort of left scratching my head wondering why all these things are broken and why people insist on breaking things continuously. I don't know. I know our motto is not all change is progress, and it can be a little bit cliched, but there seems to be an awful lot of make work, to use the expression I did earlier, involved in the computing industry. Well, I've said it before and I'll say it again, developers are going to develop. They're not just going to make something and then sit back and retire, are they? Yeah, maybe we should have some sort of uh, tally chart of how often you use that use that particular phrase. Uh, well, while we're having a little uh, intro chit-chat, I have a question. So when you do the sudo command and you type your password in, like the moment you press enter, like th- the moment that that enter key makes an electrical contact, the command is run, assuming your password is correct. It is instantaneous to run the command. But if you type the sudo command and you get your password wrong, it sits there for like a second, a second and a half, and then says, sorry, wrong password. What is it that takes a second and a half to work out if it knows the password is right when the password is correct? I don't, and it, it baffles my mind every time. I suspect that's to stop brute force attacks. Ah, uh, but... Hmm. But it only lets you try three times, so you couldn't... I suppose you could then just rerun the pseudo command over and over again. Yeah, I've never actually tried doing that to see whether there's a delay if it knows it's just just been run as opposed to typing a password in. So, yeah, I don't know, actually. You might have to write a script and um, get it to try over and over again and see see what happens. I'm sure we've got a lot of leaked hacksaws listening to the show, so I'm sure they could tell us. Yeah. Um, all right, then. Well, that'll do it for the intro. Let's get on with the news. There have been occasions in the past when we've been accused of covering too much mobile news and not enough desktop and proper Linux and people saying that mobile phones aren't proper computers and we should be covering GNU slash Linux. Well, the first couple of news stories sort of justify why we talk about mobile so much. And the first one of those is that global PC shipments have declined for the eighth consecutive quarter which doesn't include Chromebooks, but pretty much all other types of PCs, whether it's desktops and laptops. And so what does that tell you? It tells you people aren't buying as many PCs anymore, which is not a surprise to me and shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. Yeah, and this is specifically desktop PCs, isn't it? Because mobiles, which include notebooks and two-in-ones and such like, did have very low uh, single-digit year-on-year growth. And as you mentioned, Chromebooks are also doing quite well and actually better than the PC side of things. But as regards your old-fashioned box and desktop, nobody's buying them. I, mean, I don't think this is particularly surprising news, is it? I mean, even if I was going to buy uh, a new PC of whatever type, it would likely be, money you know, notwithstanding, it would likely be a high-end laptop because you get more benefit out of it. And I know because you can move it around, you can take it places, put it on the train, what have you, and have all of your computing power. And I know that this you're going to echo the same thing, Joe, because you often say, why would you have a box when you can have a laptop and move it around and things? So I suppose I do see the PC as dead. I was surprised to see that laptop sales were not declining as well because, you know, tablets and two-in-ones and Chromebooks are sort of stealing that part of the market as well. I think we're going to come back to tablets a little bit later in the news because phones seem to be killing that market stone dead. Yeah, yeah. as I was saying, I did realise that tablet sales have, have absolutely uh, plummeted, haven't they? Because, like I say, phones get bigger, it sort of, sort of steals the market. Um, also, our, our favourite laptop producer, maker, that we love to hate, uh, Lenovo, who have covered in the news recently, uh, is looking at buying Fujitsu's business, uh, PC business, which seems a little odd, given that Fujitsu's computer business is, is making a loss at the moment and Lenovo aren't exactly flying high and we've just said that sales are going down. It seems like an odd time to decide to to incorporate that as well into their into their business. But it just looks like they're becoming the single source of supply for laptops and PCs. Fujitsu will always have a special place in my heart because it was the first ever laptop I had was a Fujitsu Siemens. The the first one that was properly mine, sort of thing. And it was so terrible looking back. It was so slow and everything and not even very well made. That's sort of funny you should say that because I remember the day that dad came home with a Fujitsu PC from well, whatever shop it was. He hadn't gone out to buy a PC but came back with one. And it was this, I didn't even realise Fujitsu made them at that time. Um, but our IT at work is done by Fujitsu. So they're sort of back in my eye at the moment. 
If you want to get into some really old memories, I can remember when my father came home with his first computer, and that was an Osborne One, which doesn't really count as a laptop if you ever go and look at a picture of one. It's a hulking great big thing. <laughs> Did you have to dedicate a room in your house to it? <laughs> I remember the smell, though. I was, I was talking about this to someone else the other day. It had a very distinctive smell about it, and uh, it comes to mind from time to time. Wow, I'm just looking at a picture of it now. I, I vaguely recognise that. Did it have two floppy drives? Yeah, it did. Um, and a tiny little screen. I can't remember how big it was. It was like four or five inch. Uh, <laughs> it's ridiculous. Running CPM and stuff. Yeah, and all sorts of serial ports all over the front of it by the looks of things. Wow. Anyway, we should uh, get back to the uh, the plot here. Yeah, from, from the very large to the very small and the Atom processors... Uh, the Intel Bay Trail and Cherry Trail work well with Windows, but don't work so well with uh, with Linux. So you have some problems with loss of HDMI audio, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth when you're trying to run, for example, Ubuntu on these Intel Atom PCs. And so you can actually get a, a custom-made kernel which has taken some um, kernel mods and incorporated them in, and you can just get that as an ISO image. The problem with this is that because it's a custom-made kernel, it won't update when you do a pseudo app get uh, dist upgrade. So he has also written a script, uh, and it's all available on Linuxium. He's written a script that allows you to do sort of a, a sideways update, if you will. You know, it, it recognizes that it's odd and, and does its own update. Uh, so if you have one of these Atom-based PCs that you're looking at putting Linux on, there's a way of, of making it work. Yeah, and another contender for oddness at the moment is the Risk Five instruction set and the number of chips that are starting to be developed for that. And recently, someone tried to get uh, support for that architecture into GCC, and it's not going particularly well. It, it would appear that the FSF, as usual, want copyright assignment, and the lawyers in question from Berkeley are suggesting they don't really like that idea. Now, I understand the FSF like assignment because it gives them some standing if they actually want to go after violators. But it also means they're in the position to be able to change the license out from underneath whoever it is who gave them the code in the first place. So I don't know. I mean, what do you guys think about this? Well, I saw someone comment that what's wrong with just GPL V whatever plus, you know, or later, surely that is enough. You don't have to assign your copyright to the FSF in order to make it so that you've not got problems with copyright later on. It, it seems a little bit over the top for them to demand that and and mean that you can't have GCC running on Risk Five. My understanding is if you're wanting to contribute directly to one of the GNU projects, you do have to go down the copyright assignment route. Well, surely that puts people off. I'm sure it does. And I don't really know it's been a huge issue in the past because there hasn't really been any competition out there, as Rob was suggesting when we spoke to him. But obviously LLVM's coming along in leaps and bounds now and is starting to make some serious inroads in the compiler space. Okay, so just excuse my ignorance for a moment, but I don't think or I don't believe that the Risk Five architecture is that common. Is that is that bigger? It's not that big a pool of of people to target. So is it really that big a deal if they don't have support for it in GCC? I think it probably is going forwards, to be honest, because it isn't that big a deal at the moment. But it's an open architecture, and obviously could replace a lot of the stuff we have running today. And that's obviously the hope out there for the folks sort of developing on this side of things. And I would wish it very well indeed in comparison to all the sort of proprietoriness there is around ARM and Intel. But is it ever going to be powerful enough? Because it, you can be as open as you like, but and you can be as power efficient as you like, I suppose. But if you haven't got the, the grunt to run the software that we need it to run, then it's not going to succeed. But wouldn't people have said that about ARM, you know, five years ago? And now, because it's been so heavily used and, and money's been pumped into it and development and it's expanded, you know, you do now have the, the concept of having ARM-based data centers because while you will need a lot of chips, they run a lot less power and a lot less heat. So they actually, you know, are almost at the point where they can can compete with sort of x86 and things. Yeah, I suppose so. And I suppose we therefore need to have things like GCC. We need to have mainstream software running on the architecture. Otherwise, it's not going to succeed from, from that angle. So is there a solution to this? It is the main question. What are we going to do about it? I suppose not a lot, really, if the FSF are going to be this stubborn about it. And 
the Berkeley people are going to be stubborn about not assigning their copyright, then we just it's not going to happen, is it? Yeah, I'll have to use a different compiler. And so, you know, the death of the GCC. Oh, well, that'll make Paddy happy. <laughs> ah, competition's always good, even if it's uh, from GNU guys. Fair enough. Well, yet more proof that the industry is moving towards mobile, and that is that there are now more than 12 million mobile developers, and they're mostly targeting Android and, to a slightly lesser extent, iOS. And that 12 million is out of a total of 21 million which seems not that many to me. You'd think there'd be more software developers out there because there's so many people graduating computer science and getting into it. So I'm, I'm surprised at the the lowness of that figure. But it just goes to show that the industry is going this way. Yeah, there's an interesting sort of geographical spread of those developers because, like you said, the majority are Android developers and that will be common for China and India and places uh, that have Android as the bigger market, obviously. Whereas, I think if I read it right, it, there was slightly more or e possibly equal iOS developers when you looked at maybe North America, where, you know, the handset usage, uh, there's a lot more people who have Apple devices, and certainly uh, England would fall into that as well. Yeah, it never ceases to amaze me this, that sort of the US and the richer parts of this country, the amount of Apple usage out there compared with the rest of the world for android anyway yeah i mean you travel around on the tube and it's almost all iphones in that london whereas you go to the back of beyond where you live paddy and it's almost all android isn't it it is yeah and a surprising amount of windows phones as well because they were incredibly cheap when they were released what windows phones windows phones yes oh you live in a fantasy world don't you <laughs> But yeah, you know, so currently I'm working at Canary Wharf, which is uh, full of big glass skyscrapers and things, and you get in the lift, and it's just Apple, 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 and I sit there with my one Android phone thinking, oh, I'm very, very much out of my zone here. Is that your new Android phone? It is my new Android phone, yeah. How are you finding it? Uh, absolutely great. Uh, it's not got as long a battery life as I was maybe expecting, but it charges so fast on dash charging, it's almost not a problem. Uh, however, I have had one little annoyance, which actually sort of is a bit of a half Apple, half Android segue if I, if I go with it. So on Apple devices, I've always been a little bit jealous of in a meeting and someone's phone rings or makes a noise, there's a little slider on the side to switch it to silence. And I thought that was quite a nice addition, and it's basically unique to Apple phones, apart from OnePlus, who have a similar slider on the side, which allows you to go from uh, all notifications, priority, and silent, the sort of three notification levels within Android. And I thought that was a great addition. It meant that, you know, go to a meeting, slide onto silent, go into the cinema, slide onto silent, you know, come out, slide onto every, you know, you, you have fingertip control to these three levels. But what I realized was that without that slider, Android has a really useful feature where you can set when priority notifications is enabled. So for example, I used to have it from seven in the morning till six at night, the, the work period, it would automatically switch over to priority. And then when I came home, you know, finished work, it would switch back to all notifications and it would be, you know, effectively the old loud, if you will. But now that it has a slider, you can't set that automatic transition. So you have to be thinking about it every time. And I'm caught out every week where I haven't slid my slider to be silent or, you know, priority. And it, it's actually more annoying than not having it because what I've realised is that Apple people don't have automatic times to go to silent because they have this stupid hardware switch. And now I've got that stupid hardware switch. And uh, it's, it's much less useful than I was hoping it would be. What kind of caveman doesn't have his phone on silent and notifications on a smartwatch? <laughs> well, if this is one plus one's way of increasing smartwatch sales, it may well work. Well, the answer might be Cyanogen mod, because maybe that will give you that functionality back rather than Cyanogen. Oh, it's not Cyanogen OS, is it? It's um, Oxygen OS. Yeah, Oxygen. However, because it's got that hardware feature, I think the, the ROM would be made looking at that hardware feature. It wouldn't just ignore it. It'd be really useful if you could slide it and like have anything happen on the phone you wanted to, maybe open the camera or something. But the other problem is that, I'm sorry for, to go on about this, but this has just got me this, this last couple of weeks, is that when you go to priority only, you can say, you know, I want to hear messages from people in my favourites and phone calls from people in my favourites so that, you know, if my parents or my best friends ring, I'm aware. But it doesn't change the volume. 
So you go from all notifications on loud because you're out and about or you've left it in the lounge and you want to be able to hear it no matter where you are in the you know in your room it doesn't uh, in your house it doesn't really matter but when you slide it to all it doesn't it doesn't make it any quieter so it goes off at work at basically full volume if one of my friends calls me it's it's just it's very frustrating and I thought it was going to be brilliant um however you have touched on Cyanogen OS and I should probably stop ranting about my my Android phone uh, because we've got a, a topic on Cyanogen OS that this is not Sanjin Mod, to be absolutely clear. This is Sanjin OS. And they're looking at sort of moving to a more modular setup. So they did have uh, their selling point or the USP was that if someone had a phone they were making, they could go to Sanjin Inc. and ask for certain features to be within the ROM that they loaded on their phone. So I want this from AOSP. I want that. Can you make it for me? And they would sort of be able to tweak it to best work with the phone or the way that the phone manufacturer wanted Android to work for them. And now they've gone one step further and sort of pre-packaged modules uh, so that you can slip them in and out. And I think this is for the phone manufacturers to do. And so if you wanted, uh, for example, Cortana rather than the Google uh, helper, okay, now is it still? Whatever it is they've called it now. And you you can sort of swap one out and swap one in and it will it'll integrate as seamlessly as you want that that automated helper to be. So it's it's a it's a bit of a change and I think it is reflecting the fact that Cyanogen OS has not done as well as they were hoping and this is sort of a quite a different uh tack to take. That's the question. Why didn't it do as well as people were expecting? Because I think we expected it to do quite well. Do you think perhaps Google's been around having quiet words with manufacturers? Got your tinfoil hat on there, everybody. Well, it, that somewhat makes sense, I suppose. But I think it's probably more a case of why would people be interested in this other thing when just having Android is enough and having a 4K screen or whatever. If you're a major manufacturer, do you really need to have a gimmick like Cyanogen OS with the extra features that that brings and all the customizations and customizability, if that's a word. I just don't think many people would be that interested in that, would they? Yeah, but you don't have to be interested in it enough to want to buy the phone because it's running Cyanogen OS. Um, you would want to buy the phone and be pleasantly surprised that it is Android but with these sort of useful features and functions that your phone manufacturer has has custom uh, included, customly included. Again, I'm with you, Joe. I'm not quite sure my words are. But I, I'm thinking, I'm looking at my OnePlus thinking, this is surely a prime example of a small hardware manufacturer who needs Android, but a sort of tweaked custom version on it, for example, for this hardware switch like I talked about. Yet they've made their own one, Oxygen OS. So, you know, why aren't they using Cyanogen OS? Well, because they fell out with Cyanogen Inc., didn't they, over updates in India? Oh, yeah, that's a good answer. Yeah, fair enough. Anyhow, I'm sure there's going to be a little bit more phone talk later in the news. So uh, let's just talk about something else for a moment. Anyone who follows our Twitter feed, and you certainly should, uh, would have seen a couple of videos I posted links to during the last week or two. And the first one was a fireside chat uh, between Linus and David Rustling. And... Particularly interesting in that was about ARM and how Linus isn't that impressed with the ecosystem around ARM and doesn't think they're doing themselves any favours, the ARM manufacturers. And he also said that PCs and x86 are more open than ARM, which was a bit of a surprise to me. Because you've got all the proprietary blobs to make the x86 processors run. Surely that's a headache for kernel developers. As opposed to ARM processors, some of which you've got more open access to so i was a bit surprised there but yeah he's, he's not very impressed with the infrastructure i suppose is the word yeah it's all the tooling around it i think isn't it and the sheer variety of products in the marketplace to be honest whereas on x86 you're only looking at a, a couple of different variants you've got a target and the other video i linked to was um one by leonard and it was his state of the union address on system d and tacked on the end of that presentation uh was a discussion about portable services and i've seen nothing really in the news about this and i'm surprised about that okay well i watched this video and i was a bit baffled by it to be honest i didn't really get exactly what he meant by it so 
Can you explain it to me in layman's terms, <laughs> please, Paddy? Unlike you, Joe, I didn't watch this video, and so I'd really like it to be explained in layman's terms. <laughs> oh, you are evil, you two. Um, there wasn't a huge amount of detail. I suspect Leonard's going to be talking more about it at the Santa Fe Plumbers Conference in early November. But basically, they seem to be rolling up more of the uh, packaging around containerization, so producing a sort of mini docker, if you like. And it was very much undersold. He was sort of talking about system services, which kind of gives you the impression it's something that nobody uses or it's just system orientated. But really what they're talking about here is running things like Apache or MySQL Server, things that all of us use in their own little containers. And although it wasn't being sold as such, I can see this creeping in a little bit and intruding into the space that things like Snappy and Flatpaks are actually inhabiting at the moment. So yet another standard. Great. Yeah, and I'm sure we'll find out a little bit more next month when Leonard does another presentation on this. Hopefully a little bit more detail and people will have had some questions forming in their minds since they saw his original talk. But uh, yeah, certainly interesting things afoot over at System D. All right, well, let's get back to mobile and Google. And it feels like a long time ago now because it happened just after we put out the last show. But they had their big event where they announced loads of new stuff, including the ridiculously overpriced pixel phones not just overpriced but i do also have to say one of the worst looking phones i've seen in a long time i i I just think it looks bad from most angles i don't really care what phones look like as long as they have got a nice screen and i'm going to put it in a case anyway so i'm not bothered about that for me it's about build quality features hardware specs software it's going to run and very importantly, price. And if you compare the OnePlus 3 that you've just bought for 330 quid with the Pixel XL, which is 700 plus, it's just an absolute no-brainer. Who would buy this? It, it, I just don't understand. They, they've basically targeted these phones at the iPhone crowd. So they are the same price as the iPhone 7 and the 7 Plus and yet it's an android phone that the whole point of android is that it's cheaper than ios you you people aspire to have an iphone but can't afford it and buy an android phone and google is trying to position these phones as a premium product that can compete with apple and i just do not understand the logic of that yeah they're moving to a a made by google kind of brand aren't they and and this being the first google only phone i.e I'm right in saying it's made by Google rather than by LG or HTC or something, aren't I? Well, if you believe Google and if you read the myriad articles which just swallowed that lie, then yes, it's totally made by Google, no problem. This is this is why there's sort of questioning tone in my voice because I I can't understand how they're making phones i mean obviously the the answer would be they bought a phone manufacturing plant but you don't just you don't just rock up and build a 700 pound phone out of the blue someone someone is making these for them but they're sort of ignoring that because the nexus line so the point i was trying to make was that the nexus line was uh, a way to have google's vision of a phone but it was always made by one of their uh approved sort of phone manufacturers htc lg samsung whoever yeah huawei that sort of thing yeah and so with the nexus say the nexus 4 and 5 they went to lg and designed it with them and lg made it and google completely controlled the software and the fact that it had an open unlockable bootloader that kind of stuff Where, whereas with the pixel phone they are claiming to have made it but the the reality of it is htc has made these phones and so they've gone to HTC with a design and worked with them and controlled the software. And it sounds awfully familiar, doesn't it? It's basically a Nexus. It's nothing has changed except the marketing. And I find it incredibly disingenuous by Google to claim that it's any different from a Nexus and that it's somehow made by Google. And that was what the whole event was. And I haven't looked into the other products that they claim to have made, like their um, Amazon Echo ripoff and their new Wi-Fi routers and stuff but there's no way they made them they subcontracted it out to other oems that's how the world works and why are they trying to lie about that rhetorical question because the answer is obvious they want to be apple they want to compete with apple 
And uh, to be fair, I mean, I, I talked about how the the price of these phones was the same as the Apple equivalents. If you look at the Samsung phones, they're almost the same price. The Galaxy uh, 7, is it S7, is slightly cheaper than an iPhone and this Pixel, but I think the Edge is about the same price. So it's I suppose that they're just trying to get into that higher end. They've had enough of selling cheap phones with a, a small markup. Now they want to have a huge markup on them and compete with Samsung and Apple. But I don't know, maybe people will swallow it, the kind of people who don't actually buy their phone, the kind of people who just get it on higher purchase with their contract. But for me, it just... <laughs> It can be a great phone, but it's just massively overpriced. Yeah, of course, it's got the unique selling point of having this wondrous assistant thing bundled in, hasn't it? Which is only available on the Pixels. If it's anything like we tried in Allo, I'm not interested, quite <laughs> frankly. Yeah, and some people have got it working on other devices as well, so it isn't actually uh, unique to the Pixels. Um, thinking about the Nexus line before we move on, I, mean, I think killing that is going to have a big impact on third-party development and people of working on other operating systems like Ubuntu, for instance. Well, I think you're totally right, Paddy, yeah, because you can go and buy, or you could go and buy a Nexus 4 or 5 brand new for a, a reasonable price. And if you're a mobile developer, it, it wasn't a ridiculous thing to spend two or 300 quid or maybe three or 400 quid on a phone to develop for but to be spending six or seven hundred quid it is just ludicrous and obviously then the second hand market has that trickle down effect and it's going to be much more because right now you can pick up a nexus four or five so cheap and then do your development on it so yeah i think you're right yeah i mean it, it started with the nexus six i remember when that came out thinking it's too big and it's far too expensive and then the 5x and the 6p were too expensive as well and so they've been it's this isn't an overnight thing is it they've been building up to this and really the nexus 5 was the last one that made any sense so off of phones was there anything else from the announcement that really stuck out for you there certainly wasn't for me as joe said earlier it's sort of like a whole variety of devices that other people have and they're bringing out their own versions of them i mean it's just like a, a me too show really yeah i mean their mesh network routers seem quite interesting that you can put them all over your house and it'll just seamlessly um, transition between them and you'll have proper coverage but you've got to have a pretty big house to warrant that haven't you yeah i think that was clearly designed at the uh, north american market well yeah i think you can't even get them outside of america so yeah not particularly interested in that i mean not particularly interested in anything that they're doing really for at this made by google event i would be far more interested in what people are doing in the far east really um, be it Huawei or Xiaomi or OnePlus, because they seem to have lower overheads or be able to swallow taking less of a markup or something, because those phones are so much cheaper for such a better spec. And as long as I can run CyanogenMod on them, that's all I'm interested in. I'm not interested in running stock Android anymore. It's bloated and it's got all these features that I'm not interested in, Google Now and Assistant and all that. I just want a stripped down phone that will run my applications quickly. Yeah, and I know you keep bringing this back to phones, but Jesse was asking about the other things there, and I was fairly dismissive. The other sort of question I'd ask around those is, would you buy them if you're actually thinking things through properly? Because now we're at a stage where Google has killed off so many of these things, abandoned them. I think you've got a Nest, haven't you, Jesse? Uh, it's a Tado. It's like a Nest. It's like a Nest. Okay. But a lot of people have fallen into this trap of buying products from Google and Google just pulling the rug out from underneath them. So would you go out and buy an Amazon Echo equivalent from Google? You're talking about like the Nexus Q and things like this, aren't you? I am, yeah. I mean, there's a whole history on both the hardware and the software front that they bring something out, make a big song and dance about it, and two years later it's forgotten about. Funnily enough, they were talking about this on Bad Voltage that was released today. I uh, was listening earlier on. And yeah, it, it does seem that we're at this point where Google can't be trusted to support things long term beyond obvious profit makers like YouTube and Gmail and Search and I suppose the, the base Android operating system. But yeah, things that they are branching out into, 
I, I probably wouldn't want to back that horse, even if I was interested in home automation and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, they seem a bit like a sort of ADHD child, don't they? Constantly running from one thing to the next and off they go. But the one of the items that came out isn't new, and that's the VR headset. And I have to say, I've sort of fallen back in love with my Google Cardboard uh, with my new phone. The, the accelerometers are a lot better, so it's a lot more reactive and it feels a lot more immersive, whereas the, the sort of hacked together uh, moto that I had it wasn't so good. It would maybe drift now and then. It's quite awkward. Um, so I'm very likely, assuming the OnePlus 3 is in the compatible phone list, very likely to look at buying their new VR headset because it comes a little remote. You, you know, there's that extra level of immersion if you can, I don't know, hold a sword or whatever it might happen. Um, I think it's quite good fun playing with VR. And where it's not Four hundred pounds for a full VR setup, but it's more like sixty quid. Okay, that's still high, a lot higher than the Google Cardboard, which was like a little bit of fun. But if it gives you a much better experience, and as things develop, there are more ways in which you can use VR and more apps and and what have you. It, I think it'd be quite uh quite good. So yeah, I'm I'm going to see if my phone's compatible and see if the price is reasonable. Just don't tell your girlfriend what you're doing with it, eh? <laughs> yeah, what's that second remote for? <laughs> Um, talking about Google dropping things and, and you can't trust them, um, there is a, a list of applications that Google insist phone manufacturers include when they ship Android on their devices. And these are things like uh, Google Keep, Google Music, Google Play, uh, Gmail, the, the, the sort of you know the big popular ones, popular because Google have pushed them probably. And Hangouts was always on that list. However, Hangouts has now been demoted to optional as an included application, which looks like it's making way to allow Duo to come in and be the required app instead. Yeah, and it is Duo. It's not Duo and Allo, is it? Yeah, so it's just video calling, no text chat, which uh, does this mean they've just accepted that WhatsApp have won? I think that's probably part of it. And the other part is allowing carriers to ship what they want because obviously it's one of the most used apps on the phone and offers a great opportunity for monetization potentially going forwards. But when I see Android installs, whether it be uh, you know the, the Android version that my phone comes with or routing it and putting something else on or what have you, there always seems to be Hangouts and a messaging application separately. And what you can say is allow Hangouts to do my text messages or allow this other messaging app to do the text messages as, as it normally would. And I wonder, is that... Is that normal? Is that because I'm using ROM software and, and it's installing a second one as well? I mean, even on the phone I've just bought, it's come with these two applications. So is the second application a Google one? Or is that like a really basic messaging app that OnePlus have included because you don't have to have Hangouts? Well, there's an SMS app in AOSP messaging, I think, or Messenger or whatever. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, so the, that you have to have an SMS app. You can't expect to have Hangouts do it by default in AOSP because Hangouts is proprietary. So that's probably the, the answer to that question. Okay, yeah, because it's Oxygen OS, they've included AOSP and they've put Hangouts on top as well. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but that's not a competitor to things like WhatsApp though, is it? Because that's obviously reliant on and being charged via the actual phone network. It's not sort of like an over-the-top free-use system like WhatsApp. Yeah, essentially it doesn't work with Wi-Fi is what you're getting at. Yeah, in a long-rounded way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it'd be, it'd be really, really useful if it did, if there was a SMS method of getting all the benefits of WhatsApp. Because the problem is, if you want to start a WhatsApp group or chat, and the person you're messaging doesn't have it, you can't chat to them. You know, people, friends who have iPhones want to do uh, iMessage chats, and I don't have that. And so it, you end up in these little weird boxes. And as I've mentioned on a podcast a little while, or many moons ago possibly, I've got like four, five messaging apps because they are all independent siloed, whereas every single phone accepts SMS. So it'd be nice to have one constant, but I know that's not what we're going to have and and that's just the way the way it is now well nice it would be to have one constant thing there are a multitude out there and news about a couple of those 
Firstly, the Signal, um, which is obviously available for iPhone, Android, and the desktop, now supports disappearing messages. And sort of these ephemeral messages uh, can be timed to live for anything from five seconds to a week. Um, they're making the very sensible point that this isn't really a security feature because anyone can sort of screenshot the phone when they actually get, get a message. So just treat it as a way of keeping your data clean. They talk about data hygiene here. The other thing they're pushing out is a numeric fingerprint format, which means that you can then verify you're talking to who you think you are by sharing a QR code or reading out a hex number to each other. I was a bit surprised by this because it's been a while since I used Signal, but I'm sure last time I did, it actually had that already. I think what they were talking about is they've changed the way that they have that. So previously it was a lot longer, had letters and numbers that made it difficult to maybe do letters if you were conversing with someone from a foreign language or or you wanted to send it to someone who doesn't have uh, our alphabet as their their alphabet. Whereas having numbers, nearly every every language has numbers and, and they're very easy for phone uh, software to pick up when you're saying one, two, three, four, because there's only 10 to know. So you can be very clear as to when someone's reading them out, you, you can pass it a lot quicker. So I think they just changed the method with which they have those handshakes. Oh, you're right, looking at the story. I'd actually misread it. I thought it was still Hex. That's what threw me totally. Anyway, um, yes, there's some small changes there from Signal and also from Wire. And Wire is another encrypted chat app, and that's now available in beta form for Linux. It provides chatting, as I mentioned, and also video and group chats. And uh, apparently the Linux beta's got the same feature set as Wire's other platforms, um, which includes always-on end-to-end encryption. So it's probably worth a look at if you're using Wire on another platform. Yeah, maybe we should give it a go. Let's move on then and return to WoSign, which we talked about last time and how Mozilla are not trusting their certificates anymore, at least debating whether to revoke trust in them. And Apple have stepped in and decisively said that they are not going to trust them anymore. So it's bad news for Wosign and it's bad news for Startcom, which uh, Wosign bought recently. Yeah, if I remember rightly from the last show, Mozilla was sort of outlined where Wosign had done done wrong and hadn't actually made a decision as to what they were going to do about that. Whereas Apple has just come straight out of the blocks and said, we're revoking all their certificates in a security update. So they seem to be a lot more proactive and just, just gone out and done it. Yeah, Mozilla still are talking about this and of sort of discussing when they might drop a guillotine on Wosign certs. Um, I've not been very impressed, to be honest. I mean, I mentioned last show that Mozilla obviously is very close with Let's Encrypt, um, and I think there's a conflict of interest there. But reading the post from Mozilla, they're proposing a date either a week or a couple of weeks in the future to actually say any certificates um, issued thereafter will not be honoured fundamentally. And... I don't know. I mean, if you're going to do that to somebody, I think you ought to give the public, the people who are actually going out getting certificates, a little bit of notice, to be fair. Spoken like someone with a Startcom certificate. Yeah, spoken like someone with a Startcom certificate. Um, I renewed ours this week, actually, and I've been umming and ahhing about using Let's Encrypt, and at this stage, I really would rather not, to be fair. Um, I don't like the automated process. I don't like the length of certificates. The, um, they're only three months and I like to just generate my own signing request, go and get a certificate from a certificate agency, um, domain verified, and know it's got a decent shelf life on it, and I can do what I like with the chain of certs. I can I can build up for the web, which we use. I can create a different lot for um, our email services, which, again, I use. I mean, to be fair, I think a lot of it is down to my ambivalence to the whole regime and the fact it's hoop-jumping fundamentally. I mean, we only use encryption to keep google happy and that isn't a state of affairs i'm particularly keen on uh, i know there's a couple of folks who always write in when we talk about certificates and say how wrong we all are and particularly i am and it's the best thing since sliced bread but i mean google we've spoken about uh, bringing out changes to chrome in particular so that it warns you if you try and use self-signed certificates or you haven't got one at all um, on your website and they're pushing everyone down the https route and on the email side of things, all three of us connect our Gmail accounts to our web server. And a good while back, Gmail stopped talking to servers with self-signed certificates. So you have to have a proper certificate. 
And of course, to get a proper certificate, either you get a free one from Start.com or Let's Encrypt, or you pay through the nose for it. And I'm not happy paying through the nose for it. But uh, hang on, surely Let's Encrypt, you can just set up a cron job, jobs are good and like, I don't understand what the hassle is there. The hassle is something is happening in the background I have no control over that has the possibility of updating itself and doing something different. And I don't know, I, I'm just old fashioned. I like to have control, I like to create my signing request, go and get it and do everything manually and know that the jobs are good and for a year or three years, as is the case. Um, because Startcom have now started issuing three year length certificates, uh, hopefully to try and survive the year's ban they're looking at from all this current palaver. Okay, fair enough. I mean, I don't have HTTPS at all on my jores.com site because it's just too much hassle and I can't send emails through Gmail. I can forward them to my Gmail account, but then I have to reply from my personal account and I'm not that bothered about that, really. I can use clause if I really, really want to, but I just haven't needed to do it. And I suppose the reason for that is Let's Encrypt just looked too much hassle and they wanted me to run a binary on my server, which I'm not very keen to do, really. Yeah, which goes back to what I was saying. And I mean, the tooling is very mature out there at the moment. I had a good look a month or two back. I think I probably mentioned on the show because I was thinking about moving over from Start SSL, who we have been using in the manual process. Um, but I'm just not comfortable with this at the moment and it, it doesn't seem stable enough to be used and that might seem like a stupid thing to say because it's probably the most popular certificate authority out there now currently on the web as we've reported previously but different people have different levels of comfort and it's not in mine at the moment but what about if apple do revoke them completely then our website's not going to work on apple devices is it yeah potentially that's the case and our numbers our listening numbers could drop right through the floor <laughs> well, you joke, but some people do listen to us from Apple devices, so we presumably would have to move to Let's Encrypt. Essentially, our hands would be forced, is what I'm getting at. Yeah, which is, again, something that really aggravates me, because I don't like being pushed into a corner by anybody, and I feel that Mozilla here um, are doing so because they started all this off and they're, they're carrying it forward. And as they have a relationship with Let's Encrypt, I think that is a, a massive conflict of interest. and. I'm feeling quite anti uh, Mozilla about this whole episode, to be honest. And it all boils down to SHA-1 certificates, which they don't accept anymore because it's not secure enough. But if you're stuck on an ancient operating system like XP, like millions of people around the world, then that's your only option, isn't it? It is, and they offered that as uh, some explanation for why they carried on issuing them, to be fair, because there are so many people running XP out in China, and they're a Chinese certificate authority and they're trying to keep the local users happy well never mind in china i still see xp everywhere i go in this country especially in enterprise in supermarket kiosks and, and stuff like that you know the, the stock control computers and everything they're all running xp so yeah i'm, I'm not surprised that they're still doing these shower one certificates but well let's hope that it all gets sorted out and we don't have to move and we can just use our certificate for three years and that's one less thing for you to worry about. Well, let's move it back to desktop Linux again, as we promised at the top of the show, and talk about Black Lab. And on October the 11th, Black Lab Linux announced that, sort of due to a shortfall in the contributions they've been getting from voluntary donors, they're going to go commercial only. Now, Black Lab might not be a name you really recognise, but apparently they do have some traction in the US government, enterprise and military space. And as a result of this change, they'll be reducing the number of full-time devs working on the project and replacing quite a few of them with unpaid interns. Ah, oh, do interns not get paid? I figured it was like uh, work experience. Well, yeah, you don't get paid for work experience, do you? That's the point of it is, as an intern, you get the experience because you, that perpetual problem of you need the experience to get the job, uh, but you can't get the experience without having the job. And so that's what the whole intern thing is about even though it essentially amounts to slavery. <laughs> but, but slavery that you've chosen, at least, let's be honest. Welcome to capitalism. Well, yeah, I was going to say, welcome to <laughs> normal life. Anyway, dragging it back to Black Lab, um, even though it's going commercial and you're going to have to pay for their releases, they apparently will be punting out free ones, um, that's free as in beer, 
after 45 days. But I, for me, this story raised two questions, really. And firstly, how do they intend to honor the offer of source that's part of the licensing agreement of a lot of the software they're using here? And secondly, whether this whole sorry tale tells us anything new um, about the difficulty of keeping all but the most high-profile community projects sort of community-funded. They have to release the source, like Red Hat do. And then inevitably you end up with things like Unbreakable and CentOS, which obviously they bought CentOS to solve that problem. But if Black Lab don't release the source, then they're in violation of the license. So they are going to have to do that. I was just sat here thinking about names for derivatives and uh, obviously Puppy springs to mind, but I think that's taken already. But just dragging it back to the funding aspect of things. I mean, we know that some of the higher profile projects, things like Elementary or Ubuntu Mate, do actually rack in a fair amount of cash from the users and can be self-sustaining. But out of all the other Linux distros out there, an awful lot of them aren't, and they do rely on donations. Yeah, but it comes down to quality, doesn't it? It comes down to just the the cream floating to the top. Ubuntu Mate and Elementary obviously offer something that people want, and that's why they succeed, whereas Black Lab clearly aren't. And that's why they're having to start charging for it. And they've probably done the maths and they've got enough government contracts to sustain themselves. And the community can just go and whistle. But this is clearly a very different type of distribution. The fact that we're saying that it's being used in uh, in government and in defence contracts and things, and we haven't really heard of it as you know general uh, home users they they don't they probably don't have the same sort of distributed funding model and community that the other ones that you've mentioned there paddy uh, elementary and and ubuntu mate they probably don't have that sort of community backing and so they can't use that funding model yeah i guess that makes sense and i suspect they're in a far more red hatty position to go back to joe's analogy that they are actually used in business and the people that tend to donate are home users to all of these projects but anyway, we like to end the news on a good news story. And unfortunately, I'm not the most reliable voice always to sell them, but I'm going to have a go. Um, and this one is about Tim Berners-Lee withdrawing from the decision-making process about baking DRM protection into web standards. And it has been sold around the web as a largely good news story. And the link I'm going to put in the show notes will be to an FSF page uh, where they're getting quite excited about this. And what's happening is that the committee who will now be making the decisions, everybody seems to be of the opinion that they're going to be a lot gentler um, on DRM than Berners-Lee appeared to be. But I'm not actually so sure about this, and I wonder if all that's going on is Berners-Lee distancing himself from what's going to be a very poorly received decision at the end of the day. It's funny that you link to defectivebydesign.org, and I was reading it, digital restrictions management, hang on, and then scroll down, oh right, yeah, FSF. Mm, okay. Nice one, guys. You're still using that old uh, meme there, trying to force that. But uh, I don't know. I think that it, you are going to have this encrypted media extensions as a standard that, because you, you need to. Because like it or not, companies love DRM. Netflix and the like are not going to remove DRM, are they? Because it's not just their decision. It's the decision of the people from whom they license the content that they're streaming to you. And if you took DRM out of it, it just wouldn't work. And you need to have stuff like Netflix in browsers, and therefore you need to have this standard. And so there's no getting around it. It's going to happen. I mean, your assumption there, Joe, is that this is the only method by which you can have it and... I guess the FSF are sort of saying if there was an alternative that had no DRM baked into the browser, you would just have to work out another way of those companies to have the DRM, but not have it come as the browser, have it in some some other separate way. Or maybe they don't care and they don't want to watch all these things. They just want to have freedom absolutely everywhere and uh, and don't enjoy the TV. Yeah, they just want plugins that are proprietary and none of their business and they're not going to install them and they don't care i suppose and as for tv i mean just go back to an earlier story in the news they're still asking for copyright assignment via the post uh, for most countries what earlier news story was that that was the risk five stuff 
they, they will accept electronic uh, in some jurisdictions, and they'll accept uh, scanned uh, signatures in some jurisdictions, but not all of them. <laughs> oh, the FSF. <laughs> All right, we better stop it there before we start going down that line all over again. Yeah, let's move on and talk about KDE. I saw that there'd been a new release of KDE Neon this week, and so I thought I'd have a look at it. And then when I mentioned it, Jesse admitted that he'd been running Chaos, which is a KDE-based distro, and then also noticed it was the 20th birthday of KDE. And so I thought, hmm... The stars have aligned. Let's talk about KDE. We don't normally do that. We have historically been pretty negative about KDE, I think it's fair to say. But as I always do, let's jump to the conclusion, and that is that I quite like KDE. So I suppose that's segment over. It's good to keep it short and sweet, yeah. Um, Just to sort of fill in, because I felt like I was having to say a dirty secret when I admitted Joe and Paddy that my laptop is now running chaos um just to fill in that so one of the joys of this show is that we get to look at lots of different distributions and uh, different applications and things and having looked at a lot of different distributions for various reviews it you become normalized to sort of what the baseline should look like and when one that is particularly good or particularly bad stands out you, you you sort of take notice and chaos was one of those and the reason that i liked it so much was I think it was the first time I'd seen KDE 5 and I'd always disliked KDE 3 and 4 but 5 was a lot fresher it's a lot sort of cleaner and Chaos have put a lot of effort into specializing in the KDE desktop environment rather than having multiple ones so they're really focused on on that and I, I really liked it the problem was that they are not only focused on the desktop environment, they're also focused on their packages. And so there was a limited number of packages you could install, and that was the killer. However, recently, a couple of weeks ago, I was reading their page, and it said they used Pac-Man, which meant, of course, you could install the AUR. And I thought, ah, here we are. So this is this is all my problems are solved. I can just use the AUR. So it's not Arch. It is a custom distro, but it does use Pac-Man. So that's why I reinstalled that. And and as you say, Joe, it's just pure coincidence that I'd installed that a couple of weeks ago um, and had been sort of setting up and playing around. And then Neon had their release uh, 2.8.1, I believe. And so we thought we'd have a quick chat. Now, I think the difference for me between older KDEs and this one is they've got the awful oxygen icon set and and the look of that sort of oxygen theme and have moved over to breeze and it's a lot slicker a lot more modern a lot fresher and you you can actually look at the screen without your eyes bleeding at the the sight of the awful oxygen theme so that's that's a big step up as far as i'm concerned straight away so what is it about kde in chaos that you actually like i suppose i would flip that question as to how many things does a desktop environment have to do wrong or badly for you to decide not to use it? So, I mean, people say, oh, I couldn't possibly use Cinnamon or or I can't stand Unity. But when I use those desktop environments, I set up my shortcuts either on the main menu or on the desktop. So the sort of four or five applications that I use all the time are quickly to hand. I generally run them full screen or, or I pin a terminal to the top so it's always available and I just do my thing in the terminal, in the web browser, and I load other applications. I, I don't feel that the desktop environment holds me back that much. And because we do this show, it is useful to have a uh, sight of these different desktop environments so that when we mention one or the other, if you know, I'd been using Unity for a year and a half or so, and I hadn't really seen where GNOME was, I hadn't really seen where KDE was. And so by having GNOME on my uh, main machine this machine i'm recording on now and kde on my laptop it means that i get to sort of see both sides so i guess it's just you know keeping abreast of the various desktop environments that was a very long way of saying it's not bad enough to get rid of Uh, yeah i guess yeah that's that's basically what i'm saying (laughs) well like if i loaded lxde i just don't really I, i find it kind of a bit basic and i feel like i'm not getting the most out of desktop environment whereas kde has as everyone you know knows, it's sort of its, its theme, isn't it? It has everything you can want, plus a little bit more. Yeah. So let me get the negative stuff out of the way, first of all. So in this latest release of KDE Neon, the defaults are horrible. 
you've got all these animations you've got widgets and just the the way it's set up i do not like at all and that puts me off and has historically put me off but i wanted to persist with this and i've heard that kde is really customizable and it really is you can turn the animations off although you have to do that one by one that's not a huge problem removing the desktop widgets is easy and then what you end up with is very similar to what i'm used to you've got this menu which is a searchable menu which acts as it should do you type the name of the application press enter boom it's open and you can even right click on stuff in the menu and add them to quick launch which is good because i like to have a few things down there i saw a screenshot of yours paddy and realized that i never have a terminal down there and so i've added that recently as well as firefox and places and you can if you spend a bit of time with it customize it to basically however you want it to be and so you've got this cute base desktop which you can either have all bells and whistles or you can strip it down to something that resembles xfce but doesn't have the gtk well headaches and potential problems i mean paddy you are very keen on cute at least in theory yeah in theory yes yeah and and as a kind of looking forwards that's where your money is isn't it in terms of stability and and everything and you're very pro lx cute and stuff like that and so what you're left with when you customize it like i have is a very functional desktop which stays out the way and there's not a huge amount to say about it if you know what i mean if you wanted to add all these widgets and animations and all that stuff you can do that but I have realized that I can make it how I want it to be. And that's one of my major criticisms of Unity is the lack of customization. Whereas with KDE, you have all the customization that you could want and more. And as a result, I've got something that's actually very good. And Bluetooth even works with it. I've had so many problems with different desktop environments and Bluetooth. Although it tends to work well with the sort of higher end desktops that I don't actually want to use. Unity seems to work well, Gnome and Cinnamon. Whereas the desktops that I actually want to use, LXDE, XFCE and Mate, I've had no luck. But KDE joins that illustrious high end list because Bluetooth works well in it. You mentioned GTK there as well, Joe. And I mean, one of the issues on all desktops historically has been sort of how applications look that are built for the different toolkits i mean has there been any work put in to try and make things look uniform across the piece to some extent yeah i mean gtk applications seem to look you know you can tell they're a little bit different but it's they don't stick out like a sore thumb but the main thing that i'm impressed with is kde connect now we've spoken about that before it's an Android app, which I didn't actually look in F Droid. I presume it must be there. Yeah, it is an F Droid. I was on the train when I was trying to use it, and because I wasn't on a Wi Fi network, I couldn't play with it. But in that default menu, it says you need to install it either from the Play Store or F Droid. So um, those who have uh, a very free and open phone can still use KDE Connect. Okay, that's great because it's so impressive. In my notes, it says, wow, seriously impressive. Because Normally with this kind of thing, you've got all this complicated pairing and it doesn't work and you have to restart this, restart that. No problem at all. My phone and laptop were on the same network, installed it. It instantly sees the laptop, instantly pairs, instantly starts working. Massively impressed with that. And the functionality is limited at this stage, but it promises more. So the the functionality that you've got at the moment... um, The VLC remote control, for example, or media player remote control, where you can uh, change the volume, skip tracks, pause, all that kind of stuff, seem to work perfectly. Ideal for a media center type setup. Um, Although you could argue that you wouldn't want KDE on a media center, but I want a full desktop on mine. Well, I I have an XFC desktop on my media center. So that would be really useful to have. Um, And then you've got file transfers, which work well both ways. And it basically mounts the phone as a sort of network file system. And so you can just drag and drop to it, create stuff in it, in, in Dolphin, that is. Didn't work in Thunar, which I installed 
just to see because I'm used to using Thunar. But in Dolphin, the file manager in KDE, it worked perfectly. And historically, I've had trouble with Cyanogen Mod connecting to laptops uh, via USB. So that is a big bonus as well, being able to just drag and drop files onto it. And one really, really nice touch is the remote input. So when you select that, your screen becomes a multi-touch touchpad. And again, for a media center type setup, that would be really, really useful. So you don't have to have a wireless keyboard and mouse. I mean, keyboard wise, it would be nice if you could pull up an on-screen keyboard maybe, but who knows, maybe that's in the works, but at least you can use the mouse. And of course, notifications as well, which are limited at this stage, limited to phone calls and SMS, and you can't interact with them, but at least you get a notification um, in the, the bottom right to say that you've got a text or a phone call, which is nice. So overall, I am really, really impressed with KDE Connect. And I don't know to what extent it depends on the KDE stack, I would presume heavily, but I would really love to see something similar happen with other desktop environments. And I'd also love to see more functionality added to KDE Connect because I think it's got massive potential. I mean, obviously I listen to everything you say, but while you were talking, I was just playing with KDE Connect. And uh, I, I agree, it's very slick. I've used it in the past and didn't have all those features you've mentioned, but I did notice it does have a little keyboard button on my phone anyway. Ah. And you, it pops up a keyboard and I've tested it and I can type. So you do have not only a mouse with left click, right click, middle click, but also a keyboard. So you get the full, the full gambit, if you will. But can you just clarify a little bit more on what applications do work as notifications i mean you said there that you don't you can't respond it can't um send an, a a text message through the computer through the phone but but what um applications worked with it well uh, sms and phone it seems is the only applications that work because whatsapp didn't work i don't think gmail worked so it's it's limited um and it's and therefore its usefulness is limited but that to me seems to be an area that they are working on and they do say that they're working on that and so i i would love to see more functionality added to that so that you can get effectively like what i've got with my pebble where i've got all the notifications so it, you can imagine it, the phone's sitting on your desk, you're working away and you just get all of the um, WhatsApp and Telegram and whatever it is coming there. And even if you can't interact with those, at least you see one that you need to interact with, you can then pick up your phone and get on with it. Oh, but one thing I forgot is there's a find my phone feature as well. So if you're the kind of person who doesn't go out much, if you work at home or whatever, and your phone's buried under a pile of whatever uh, documents and paperwork, yeah. Uh, you can press one button on the on the desktop and it starts ringing. And so you can therefore go and find your phone and then you press, yeah, found it. Which again, nice little feature, even if it's on silent like mine was, it still made a noise. So I was really impressed with that. Yeah, that's a really, really useful feature. Um, and I will have to get back to uh, the themes and some of the customizations you can make. But while we're on the, the topic of things that you've looked at that uh, I didn't get to look at, um, as Chaos has its own uh, repos, it has its own installation manager as well. It's the, oh, I forget what it's called. It's got a ghost as a theme, but we, we talked about it when we looked at Chaos. And so it doesn't actually have discovery on Chaos whereas that's one of the new applications on on Neon. So can you just cover that as well? Well, there's not much to say, really. It just worked well. I did updates with it. I installed an application or two with it, and it just worked. So I suppose thumbs up, really. I'm sure it's probably got more functionality built into it if you want it, but I didn't. I tried it briefly, and it seemed to work, and then I just did what I normally do and open the terminal and install stuff that way. Okay, well, as I said, let's get back to some customizations that I noticed uh, in KDE. And for for example, here, here's a typical case. In the search bar, I typed in theme because I thought maybe I could change the icons or, or find the, the area in the settings menu that would show me where the customization could be done. And once you've typed in theme, it brings up 
You can icons, emoticons, the login screen, the desktop theme, the splash screen, the Windows decorations, the cursor theme, the look and feel, and the widget style, all as subtexts of, of themes. And all of these then have obviously submenus as to how you want the cursor theme, whether it's light or dark or large or small. Or, and it just goes to show the number of areas that you can make uh, changes and tweaks as you like. And I think, unlike you, Joe, who didn't really like the, the default neon, the default chaos, I've, I feel, is quite good. So there's not a lot of things you do need to customize. But when I was looking at Dolphin, which I used to absolutely hate with KD, I, it was partly the icons and it was also partly just seemed way too many um, options and buttons and, and uh, menus and things for just what is basically a, you know, a file browser. Whereas the new one is, is a lot more stripped down. It's, it's more what I sort of expect. But you can, the, the fact you can change so much about it. So all of the icons, you can right click on, and maybe there's a, an icon for uh, make a new folder or back or whatever you, and you can choose to have the word back next to the icon or not. But not just for all the icons, on an individual icon basis. So you can pick, you know, new folder to have new folder written next to it, but all the other ones just to be the icon. Um you can have a split pane, you can have multiple tabs, and you can move all these around as well. Because I'm now running GNOME, I'm doing this recording, as I said, I opened the files file browser that, that GNOME comes with, and it is just barren in comparison. And not only is it barren, you can't add anything to it. That's how it is. That's how they've stripped it down to the absolute bare essentials. And normally I don't really notice because all I'm doing is opening it to get to a file, to look at some pictures, whatever it may be. But having seen how much you can have and how much you can tweak it in KDE, for example, if you always want to open a terminal when you're halfway through um, a folder, you know, you've been searching for a particular folder or file and you want to open a terminal there, you can add the terminal button to Dolphin and it's it's customized because that's how you want to. It's it's impressive the level you need you can go to. And I think my takeaway from this was that previously I knew you could do all these things. I knew KDE was very customizable, but it just seems to be presented in a way which is more accessible. So it's presented in a way which it looks good to start with. And if you decide you want to make some changes, they're not a thousand menus deep. They're not in some weird subsetting of a window manager of a thing of a thing. They just seem to be more reachable and on the surface. And so it makes that ability to make changes much more uh, usable for for people. I, I think I always found KDE previously was very difficult to make the changes I wanted to make, and so that's a real you know real plus for this um, Plasma desktop. Well, let me counter that with one example. In Dolphin, its default is a single click to open files, which annoyed me. I want it to be single click to select and double click to open, and I had a brief look to try and change that behavior and couldn't find how to do it. Now, I'm not saying that you can't do it. I'm saying that it didn't annoy me enough for me to spend enough time to change it. So I just settled for it and learned to use it that way. So what I'm getting at here is that sometimes all of that customization might be a bit overkill, potentially. And I, I'm not convinced that they have streamlined that customization as much as you think they have, certainly from my perspective. Yeah, yeah, that's fair enough. Have they actually changed anything in a big way in this release? I mean, for instance, activities, which we've always sort of mocked, is that still there or are there any other new big features been added? Activities is still there and I did try and make an activity and I was surprised at how difficult it was to kind of make an activity and switch between the two, you know, the default desktop, if you will, and the activity that you've made for whatever it is you want to do. I th I still think deep down, it's a good idea. I think it's useful if you are, um, if you have a particular hobby, you know, I'll beat my old drum, drum of, of photography. It'd be useful to come in, okay, I'm going to have one activity for general browsing. I'm going to have another activity for when I do the podcast and I'll auto load applications. I'll have a third activity for when I want to edit photos or download pictures or what have you. And I think it would be useful. I and mean, it's not something that I think is so useful that I don't use GNOME, but I, I was surprised that it seemed to be relegated to sort of a, we also, you know, the thing was we also have activities, but 
you kind of have to look for them. It wasn't so front and centre as I've I've noticed it previously in KDE. However, as to the question of whether there's any major improvements in this one, I don't think they are. I get the impression that it's more of a a polished release and they've tried to make everything cohesive and, and work more slickly together, which, you know, from Joe's reaction, it looks like they've managed to achieve. Well, yeah, because I installed KDE using Task Cell, which we talked about before, uh, on my Chromebook, which is running Gallium OS, which is effectively Zubuntu with a few tweaks. And so I decided to install KDE on top of that to see if I could get Bluetooth to work. And I ended up with, I think, 5.5.5 of KDE, which is a few releases behind this one. And it was like chalk and cheese. It's, it's hard to describe exactly what the differences were, but it just feels that this latest release has just got polish everywhere. It's just everything is that little bit more polished and improved upon. And Bluetooth didn't work incidentally, which was really annoying. And it's basically balked the whole system. And so I'm not going to have to reinstall Galim OS, but I'm not that bothered about that. But yeah, suffice to say, where KDE is now is just at a place where it's polished and Plasma 5 has just come to a point where it's mature. And as far as I'm concerned, a very good desktop that is ready to use by anyone. On to the feedback then, and first of all, a huge thanks to our new monthly supporters, Patrizio Becala, I think, William Mason and Peter Jones. Very much appreciated, everyone, and of course, to our existing monthly supporters. And later on, we'll be telling you about another way you can help us out while uh, getting something for free yourself. So uh, contact details. You can email us, show at linuxloadouts.com. If you go to the website, you'll find links to the Twitter, Google+, and Facebook, and you can always leave a comment on the website. So we had a whole lot of people get in contact to say that they really enjoyed the Rob Landley interview. Um, again, from Patricio, uh, Luke Video, Bacon Zombie, Cubicle Nate. Um, we also had Campbell Barton and Will get long replies from Rob on the on the website. So if you want to, to read those comments and the feedback from Rob, do go to the website. They were far too long and detailed for me to do any justice to cut down um, and get onto the, the feedback that we're reading now. Uh, but there were some really good sort of back and forth. Now, um, Will's point I, I did just pull out and he said very interesting discussion with Rob especially the parts about the fruitless lawsuits and the reasoning for Google closing off more and more of Android to shield it from terrible code from carriers and manufacturers it would be interesting to hear you bring on someone with whom you disagree more maybe someone aligned with the FSF or SFC I think that would be a brilliant idea I would love to speak to one of the the hardcore copyleft people and have a debate with them and so if any of them are listening and fancy coming on the show, just send us an email, show at linuxlightouts.com, and hopefully we can get it organized. Yeah, and as I, as I said, there was a lot more um, discussion and feedback directly from Rob uh, on the website. I also uh, have to continue with a bit of an apology. We had an email uh, about a month or so ago that I seemed to skim over from uh, Dr. Majid Salim. Um, and he has done a blog on coolsmartphone.com uh, looking at convertible laptops and discussing what the best operating system for a convertible laptop will be, sort of touching on uh, Ubuntu and also Microsoft offering where Apple are, are lacking uh, and how those sort of devices work. And then comes to the conclusion, does a little piece about uh, GNOME 3 and how that's usable on these these sort of convertible laptops that have the, the removable keyboard and what have you. So um, head over to there if you have one of these. Now, none of us on the show have uh, a convertible laptop, so we've never been able to cover these in on the show. Uh, but if you do, um, I say Majid Salim has, has put together a, a little blog about that, and we'll include the, the links for the three parts in our show notes. And returning to another topic we discussed last time, Hacker Login got in touch to say, for Linux Presentation Day, you said, have a look to see if an event is happening locally. The more important recommendation would be, organise an event, even a single person has a good chance to get that done. We have more than 70 cities in Germany participating, but the highest number abroad is five, if you ignore Italy, where the situation is special. The LPD does have the potential for many hundred locations in a country the size of Germany, but you do need somebody with a lot of time available for calling the potential hosting organisations. We can't do that from Germany for other countries. And I think Hacker's actually got a point there, although 
obviously expressed in typical Teutonic fashion and no thanks there for us actually plugging the event in the first place. Ah, uh, well, you know, it's fair enough. Yeah, it's, it's a good point. Rather than just go to one, actually organize it, introduce people to Linux, software freedom and all that kind of stuff. But moving on back to mobile, Cubicle Nate got in touch to say, concerning the discussion on phones and mobile devices, I've done a lot of reading on the subject, and it seems there is still room for a third party of sorts. iOS and Android certainly have the lion's share of the user base, but I still think there's room for a Firefox OS or a true Linux phone. My thought is it would be nice for some sort of consortium of Plasma Mobile, Firefox, Ubuntu, OpenSUSE, Fedora, etc., to pool their resources and develop in the mobile space so that the work of one could feed into the other as it does on the x86 platform. I feel that there could be a really good mix of synergy combined with enough room for individual expression, and I realise that could just be a pipe dream. Selfishly, I want a little more freedom with my mobile devices. I appreciate all the work done on Android, but the rumblings of walling off the garden is making me a little uneasy. I think you've really hit the nail on the head with this cubicle note because I'm worried about Android as well. I'm worried that AOSP is becoming less and less usable as more and more of Android becomes proprietary and they could potentially make almost all of it proprietary. And then we're just stuck with a totally proprietary operating system. And I think, yeah, pooling the resources of Firefox OS developers, Ubuntu developers, and and maybe even the other x86 linux distros it would be good for them to all come together and make something but you've just always got that problem haven't you that they all want to do it their own way but there there is i think certainly when it comes to privacy and stuff like that there, there is a niche at least for people if there was a really solid linux based free software operating system people would use it and look at ubuntu people are using that already and maybe that's the one that we all need to get behind. And even if that means the equivalent of the flavors of Ubuntu that we've got on the desktop, maybe some different UIs on top of the underlying code of Ubuntu so that you can still use the applications, but you've got a more familiar interface, for example, without the scopes and stuff, uh, like Plasma Mobile are doing. May Maybe that is the way forward. And we need to just accept that Ubuntu is winning in this small niche and get behind it. Well, I do have to agree, Joe, but I, I just cannot see it happening. I mean, like you say, Cubicle Nate does make a good point. It'd be useful if rather than having one big group with iOS, one big group with Android, and then sort of 10 small divisions of all these niche little operating systems for, for phones, if, there was, if they combined to be one and took you know, this classic thing of the best of all, it, it could well be a viable alternative platform. I don't think that we are alone in worrying when we talk about Google and iOS, you know, monitoring everything that we're doing. And the more that we use the Google platform, just to take one example, um, the more information they have on us and the more sort of creepy it becomes. There are you know, normals who are having that same worry and an understanding of the amount of information that our phones have on us. And so there may well be an outlet that people are looking for that is more free and open. However, while that is a great idea, I, I think it is definitely a pipe dream to have all of these different um, groups make some sort of consortium because they'd all be wanting to use either you know, a different display server, or they're going to want to have, you know, QT rather than GTK or whatever it may well be. And so I just can't see it happening. But I agree with the idea, Cubicle Nate, but I think I'm just a little bit too realistic. So we mentioned that there's another way you can help support us, and that's with our DigitalOcean affiliate link. DigitalOcean have been on this mission to become the leading VPS and cloud hosting provider. And it looks like they're achieving that mission with their pretty affordable prices and data centers all around the world. And we're happy to promote DigitalOcean because we've been using their services for a long time now. We host all of the podcast stuff on DigitalOcean Droplets, the site, the media, the mail server, and we've never had any problems with it. And so much so that Paddy and I have even got our own private droplets that we do various things on. And whenever we want to mess around with something like OwnCloud or NextCloud or whatever, we spin up a droplet and, and use that for it. 
So if you want to have a Linux box out there in the cloud that you can have complete root access to and install anything you want and not have to risk compromising your own private network like Jesse does, then go to linuxloadouts.com slash digitalocean and you'll get a $10 credit, which if you go for the lowest price server, will give you two months for free. And we don't actually get any money from that until you spend a further $25 with them. But we have been using them for ages, so there's a pretty good chance you will. And eventually, if you keep using them, you'll end up helping out the show. So go to linuxloadouts.com slash digitalocean and get started now. But that'll do it for the feedback then. Let's move on. All the way back in August, Russell Dickinson suggested that we have a look at Phoenix OS, which is an Android-based OS for x86 computers, as well as a few ROMs for various Nexus tablets, which has a desktop interface. So it's very much like Remix OS that we looked at before, where you've got a taskbar, you've got windowed applications, and it acts somewhat like a proper desktop OS. And so we've been looking at this for quite a while now, sort of on and off and been planning to talk about it. And then the segment's been bumped, but now we're finally going to talk about it. And I actually first discovered it with Magic Device Tool, which we talked about back on episode 87, which uh, is an easy way to flash this onto the Nexus 7. So what is there to say about this, apart from the fact that it's Android with Windows? I think the first thing to say is that it's clearly under active development. So when we did start to look at it, I don't know about you guys, but the first one I downloaded was uh, 1.0.9 uh, release candidate. And when I finished looking at it, which was a couple of days back, it was 1.1.0.205 or something. And there have been quite a few updates to the browser and what have you in the interim, which is always a good sign when there is active development going on. Yeah, and no, I've had it on various machines and I keep getting updates they are quite slow to download because it's coming from China but oh they're horrifically slow they must be running like some Raspberry Pi on sort of a half broken Ethernet cable out there it is terrifically slow isn't it yeah but once you get them they seem to work fine so yeah it's good to see that it is under active development to clarify just how slow it was the three of us were downloading at the same time we all had literally hours to go to download this half gig file and it was a case of whoever downloaded it first, put it onto our drive, and the rest of us should down- just downloaded it from drive. So it was that problematic. And the thing, I mean, we can get into the, the desktop and all that sort of setup and what have you, but the file you download for the x86 version is a .exe. And immediately I am concerned because I don't run Windows And so that, to me, is an alien thing to have, and I don't know what to do with it. Uh, So I went and borrowed my flatmate's laptop, but was very nervous because you can make mistakes and you can write things to the wrong hard drive, and I was really very paranoid about uh, getting it wrong on his. But it was all good. Um, You run the executable, and it basically gives you a little USB-making sort of interface, um, and it says you, you put the USB drive in, you pick it as the as a U drive rather than USB pen or whatever. It just was the U drive, and it takes 20 minutes or so to, to write it there, and then you can boot it up on whatever laptop you have. So you do have to have a Windows PC to experiment with this if you're going to run the x86 version. Yeah, and the USB side of things was just one way of doing it, wasn't it? Because you could also install it alongside Windows. And I did that successfully on one machine and failed on another machine. And it works quite happily. It installs to a separate partition quite happily. It'll uninstall perfectly cleanly as well. Um, It doesn't seem to like coexisting with Grub, though, uh, which was an issue I hit on one of the PCs. If you've got a stock Windows install, it'll insert itself into the standard uh, Windows uh, boot screen so you get a choice between windows or phoenix os and uh, run from there quite fine yeah so i installed windows 10 to use this uh, because i managed to get an iso before they started charging for it so i've got a, a proper official free iso that nags about being activated but i'm not particularly bothered and yeah for me even with grub installed and linux on various other partitions it seemed to work fine it when you boot into windows you get that screen where you can choose either windows or phoenix and then it reboots itself 
and then you have to go back into Windows, and then it boots into Phoenix, which is a very convoluted way of doing it. And it would be nice if they also offered a standard ISO. But what what are you going to do? That's the way they do it. Which interestingly is also the way Remix OS does it these days because i had a quick look at that on the x86 version because the remix mini that we got isn't supported with the very latest version they've pretty much abandoned it which sucks but um yeah it's it's weird it reminds me very much of the way you dual boot on a mac you have to kind of do it from within os 10 rather than just separately with a bootloader it it feels uh just feels a bit dirty looking at linux distros that way and I suppose this isn't a proper Linux distro, but it is Linux based. Yeah. So once installed, you're dropped in at a a login screen, which you just uh, click on that and put your password in, and it's it's a very typical you know XP type desktop. It's got a, a start icon in the bottom left. It's got um, shortcuts along the the taskbar at the bottom. Uh, it does have a budgie like. Uh, sort of settings panel that comes in from the right uh, and it's got settings and various other shortcuts and things uh, brightness and what have you that you may be familiar with as a that would have been in a pull down from the top on a standard android install and of course all of the applications that you load load up in windows yeah and i was pleased to see that happen even with full screen apps so things like the play store which quite often in these um desktop based android implementations don't window particularly well windowed absolutely fine uh, with Phoenix, and it also supports window snapping, so you can drag stuff over to the left or right or top or what have you of the screen, and and the window will resize perfectly as you'd expect. Yes, yeah, so you've touched on the Play Store there, and Joe and I installed this on our Nexus Sevens. Simply a case of doing some fast boot type moving of the ISO over to the to the device. Um, as Joe pointed out, he used uh, Magic something, was it Joe? Magic Device Tool, I think it's called. Absolutely, and. On there, you don't have the Play Store. Nope, and you can't even flash Google Apps because it says the system is full, system partition is full, and I even uninstalled some apps, and yeah, so it just wasn't happening. So you have to use their apps, which, well, the browser it requires all sorts of permissions, including location, and it won't run without them, which sucks. And so they do have uh, an application store, which you can use. And as we touched on briefly, uh, this is a, a sort of a primarily from China. And so when you when you boot it, when you load it, the two options for language are, I, I guess, Mandarin. Is that some, something uh, Oriental that I couldn't read? You can't say words like Oriental, honestly. You, can't I? You two are like bloody old colonials <laughs> with your... Uh... <laughs> Uh, safari suits on honestly anyway carry on well base, basically it was chinese or not english wasn't it yes absolutely sorry it took me a while to work out and so the, the problem was that every now and then while the majority seemed all in english and absolutely fine now and then you'd stumble onto something and it would solely be in chinese i know that's there's no such language as chinese but let's just go with that as our terminology for not being able to read it and this was one of the problems with the App Store. So on the tablet, you don't have the Play Store, so you have to use their their custom App Store. And you go in there, and 90% of it is in Chinese, and you can maybe recognize a few icons of games or things here and there. Uh, there were a few applications that had English words on them, and you could, you could look at them, but it was not even remotely the the same level of applications you know the same number of applications as you would expect on the play store and as far as i'm concerned while there were some really really slick features with it on the tablet for example window resizing with your finger was fine you could plug in usb keyboards and things using an otg cable uh, and, and mice as well and it worked really well as a, as a desktop on a tablet and with with touch input as well but you i just could never have got over the lack of applications and you're not even running Linux, you're, you're running Android, so it's even more restricted. But one really good feature in the tablet version is uh, somewhat hidden. It's, there's an app called System Mode, and you press that, and boom, straight AOSP. So you've got just a standard tablet interface that you're used to with Android. But then if you wanted to use your tablet for more desktop-type stuff, perhaps plugged into a screen or with a keyboard and mouse, you press it again, and you're back to this windowed mode. So the ability to toggle between them, I think, is brilliant. 
It's sort of like what conversion should be. I don't think it needs to necessarily be automatic if you can just press one button and it works perfectly. So that's why it's actually running. You're not having to reboot the device? No, it switches back and forward almost instantly and works brilliantly. But it's interesting that the tablet version is based on 6.0 point whatever, whereas the desktop x86 version is stuck back on 5 point something. So you effectively got two totally different operating systems. I mean, it's the same interface, but you've got no Play Store on the tablet and no ability to add the Play Store and a newer version of Android. And then on the desktop version, you've got Play Store, but an older version of Android. So it's it's weird that you've got these two effectively just separate things. And you've got no toggling on the desktop version, which kind of makes sense. Why would you want straight up Android on the desktop? Although there is Android x86, it seems to make much more sense to have the windowing. Obviously, a whole host of nooks and crannies we could go down into, uh, things that didn't work or were a little strange, um, like network time not being picked up correctly, for instance, on the desktop version. But something I was interested in goes back to the speed aspect because it was very slow to download and updates were very slow to download. But for me, anyway, it was very slow running. And this was on a fairly ropey old laptop, but it copes with Windows 10 just about. It sort of staggers along with it. What, is that the old Vio that I gave you? Yeah, that is the old Vio. Um, so I installed Antutu and Geekbench on it, um, thinking I could do some benchmarking and then compare it against my, my phone, which is a fairly low-end Moto E. Um, sadly, neither of those would actually run. They both crashed on startup. Did you guys try benchmarking at all? No, it didn't occur to me to try. And I didn't find it was particularly slow on my much newer Vio. So I just didn't really see the need to do that. Yeah, I didn't do any specific um, benchmarking like you did, but uh, running straight off the USB drive, it seemed to be fairly peppy. It took a little while to open the web browser, but the file manager, settings, Google Play, all those sorts of things came up almost instantly. So I I think maybe it is just a, a hardware thing. One of the things I did like about it was the lack of applications, and that might sound a bit counterintuitive, but it's how I like my desktops as well. Um, I don't want a lot of stuff bundled in there that I, I don't really anticipate the need to be using. Um, it came with WPS Office, as far as I remember, um, and a few other sort of odds and sods, but there wasn't a huge plethora of applications installed like you'd expect to see on a standard Linux desktop. Yeah, and when you've got the Play Store available to you on the PC, that's fine. But when you don't have anything available to you on the tablet, it makes it almost sort of pointless. You know, the whole point of having Android is to have this massive load of apps. And now that I've said that and thinking about it, when I did try and run Antutu to try and do a benchmark, it crashed exactly like yours did. So it's all very well and good having the ability to install things from the Play Store on one of the devices. But if a lot of them aren't going to work, is it that useful really? Well, that brings us to licensing, and I couldn't find any license information at all about Phoenix OS. Uh, did you have a look for this, Paddy? I must admit I didn't. Um, my assumption was there'd be some proprietoriness in there, considering that it needs Windows to actually get installed in the first place. Yeah, well, unless it's hidden somewhere on the website, I couldn't find a link to GitHub or anything, which is a shame, because it would be nice if this interface was open source, and then you could have it on top of, say, CyanogenMod and get all the apps working as well. Yeah, as an interface, I thought it worked really well. It's probably the best Android desktop experience I've had, um, and that includes with the Remix, which was an old version of Remix OS. But as you've mentioned, the device we bought hasn't been updated anyway recently. Although it has had an update uh, fairly recently, not not a major one, but when you reboot it, you're suddenly offered all of this bloatware and the same situation when you install the x86 version you you if you just press next 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 you end up with a load of bloatware that you don't want and you have to manually go through and untick all of this software and so clearly that is their business model now the traditional windows pc model of just bundle a load of stuff and get paid for it which is very disappointing to see but then you know it is it's optional you can just untick it and i suppose they have to pay for it somehow so you know can't really complain that much I'm glad you brought up Remix, Paddy, because I, I remember saying some rather negative things about Remix OS, and as far as I'm concerned, nothing they have done has, has changed my view on that. But this version, or this implementation of, of Android as a desktop, I thought was very slick. And, and like you said, the, the windowing works really well. Um, on my PC, it was quite peppy. 
both on the tablet and on the on the laptop um you could you could resize things and it seemed to work quite nicely okay if you made the windows too small it it did have a little bit of a moment and you would have these weird graphics now and then not weird graphics but just the window didn't fit particularly well because you're taking what has always been full screen applications and making them to sizes they never would have otherwise been so that's not so great now and then but you kind of understand it and so yeah i think i think generally they've done a good job at the interface it's just a pity that for me the applications either don't run when you install them from the play store or you don't even have the option to install them from the play store because you don't have that so that's where it kind of falls down ultimately so where would this actually make sense uh, when i was looking at it i assumed on a device like you've got joe where you've got a, a touchscreen laptop i suppose so but then it's not as powerful as proper linux so I'm I'm not going to run it on that. I think it makes more sense on a tablet with a keyboard, really. Which it depends which way you look at it. I mean, mine is a touchscreen with a keyboard and touchpad, but it's it's more for those convertibles that we talked about in the feedback uh, with a, a detachable keyboard. I think, especially with this toggling mode, it, it would be good if when you docked it into the the keyboard, either you press a button or it does it automatically goes into this windowed mode and i think that's where this really makes sense rather than on standard x86 hardware because android it doesn't matter what you do with the interface in terms of the windowing and how well you make that resize and minimize and move around and snap and everything if the content within those windows is still based around touch input then there's not much point using it and i suppose yeah you could say well this will encourage developers to make more desktop friendly versions of their applications and uh, that kind of brings it somewhat to a conclusion i think and that is don't think that google is not looking at this stuff remix os and phoenix os and similar projects like this to take inspiration for what they're going to put into future versions of android they teased it a little bit with seven i think on the pixel c there was a something you could unlock to get this windowed mode but it's almost inevitable that it's coming. And I wonder whether when it does come, the way in which they're going to insist applications be written will allow windowing to be more slick. And therefore, some of the criticisms that we've had both of Phoenix OS and of Remix OS will diminish because the way in which windowed applications work will be better integrated into Android and therefore everyone benefits from that rather than trying to force what is a full screen application to be in a small window if if Google take it on board then all these types of devices will will be able to use whatever it is Google insist the application developers make well we'll have to wait and see when and if Google actually does this but for now it seems that you've got a couple of pretty decent ways to go if you want to have windowed android and hopefully they'll continue to develop and um, hopefully open source stuff so that the rest of the community can use it but with that then we're coming to the end of another linux luddites you can email us at show at linux com, find us on twitter at linux luddites or at the google plus and facebook communities or leave a comment on the website thanks for joining me paddy and jesse and thanks to everyone for listening We'll see you again in two weeks with more Linux news, reviews, comment, and generally being grumpy. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, Fenix. <laughs> see you later.